welcome to another public lecture organized by the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. It's not very often that we get uh, visitors in health policy who come by the school, but uh, this is one of the rare occasions. So uh, today we are very pleased to have with us uh, Dean Harris. Uh, he's from the Gilling School of Global Public Health and uh, University of North Carolina. Now he has a funny designation which says clinical associate professor and then he tells me that he's a lawyer by training. Uh, so you figure out what a, what a, what a clinician he is doing here, speaking on uh, Obama reforms, but he'll tell us. Uh, well, <clears throat> the, uh, most of you must have heard of the uh, passing of this very historic bill which was signed into law on March 23rd this year the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. Uh, President Obama, in his words, say, we have just enshrined the core principle that everybody should have some basic security when it comes to their health care. Now, it's uh, really amazing that the most advanced uh, country in health uh, technologies and medical care, it's taken them so long to pass this historic uh, bill. And I have, in fact, an uh, interesting email reply from the EU uh, representative uh, for ASEAN, who's based in Jakarta, he got a copy of our notice and he was here in the school as a visiting uh, expert. Um, well, this uh, ambassador, Jan, Jan Blanket, who's a friend of mine, he replied to say that, sorry, he cannot come to this, uh, this lecture, but thanks for the invitation. It looks very interesting and we'd love to attend. And he says, his view. With the adoption of the new healthcare bill, the United States of America, the richest country on earth, maybe not anymore, may finally, finally, he says, has joined the League of Civilized Nations. And this is coming from the EU representative from ASEAN, a diplomat, you know, and uh, these, are, these are his harsh words. So with that in kind of introduction, I, I don't think I need to uh, talk too much about the speaker, but he's it's, it's obviously qualified to talk to us about the U.S. healthcare system and the Obama reforms. Thank you. Okay, if it's too loud, let me know and I can turn it down. Um, well, thank you, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. My students always ask me, they say, Professor Harris, is, will this be on the test? Is this going to be on the examination? What they really mean is, do I have to pay attention? Because I'm certainly not going to pay attention if it's not going to be on the test. So I'll just stay from the very beginning. Yes, this will be on the test. <laughs> I'm going to talk today, do I point it this way? All right, talk today first of all about the context for US health reform, because of course context is very important. I'll talk about the goals of US health reform and the different methods of meeting those goals. Number three, the new federal law and the political and legal challenges to that law. And finally, the impact of US health reforms on other countries in the global community. In other words, why do we care? No. Um, and then we'll leave some time for questions. All right, context. In some ways, the US is very different from other countries. Now, I know that people outside of the United States know much more about the United States than people we in the United States know about other countries. So I'm, I won't belabor the point, but I just want to touch a few points that I think are particularly relevant to the health system and health system reform. Death rate from homicide in the United States is more than three times the average of all OECD industrialized countries. The obesity rate in the United States is about twice the average rate of 10 European countries. So in other words, we're, we, we kill each other much more often than the people in other countries, and we're a lot fatter than people in other countries. And obviously, this is going to have an effect on the health system, particularly the costs of the health system, and how we have to, things we have to do to approach health care reform. We have some unique aspects of the United States. We have about 11 or 12 million undocumented aliens, people who do not have the necessary legal visa to stay in the United States, but most of them work very hard, and we, we, this is an issue we have not really dealt with, but most of them have no health insurance. This is a real problem. We have 
about 8% of the people in the United States have limited English proficiency. And we do not do as good a job as we need to in dealing with people who do not speak English when they go to the doctor and they say, I have a pain right here, and the doctor doesn't understand what they're saying. We're trying, but that's something that we have to deal with. And our values are very different from the values in some countries. Individualism is very important to us. And in contrast, for instance, to European social welfare states based on a concept of social solidarity, our Constitution begins with the famous words, we the people. But if you ask most people in the United States, we don't always think of ourselves as a collective we. We're too big, too big, too diverse. People don't always think of themselves, not everybody, but a lot of people don't really think of themselves as we. We're very proud in the United States of our separation of church and state. But religion has a very important influence on politics in the United States, particularly on issues like abortion. Many Americans, certainly not all. Now remember, the United States is big. And any generalization, anything you say, somebody else can say the opposite. You can't, I don't mean everybody, but some people in the United States, a lot of people do not trust government. Not just because they don't trust the particular administration, but people have a, in the United States have a mistrust of government. Some people think that government is the problem, not the solution. Of course, not everybody, but there's a substantial percentage of the population that simply does not trust government. They prefer private solutions like private charity or the private market economy. And our basic document, our basic constitution, is based on the idea of negative rights, not positive rights, negative rights in the sense that the government cannot do bad things to me. They cannot do bad things to me. Not the government must do things for me. Most constitutions in existence today are based on a social welfare concept that people have a right to expect certain things from their government. But remember, the United States, we don't think of the United States, you don't think of the United States as being an old country, but it is one of the oldest continuous political systems on the planet. Certainly, the United States is not old compared to India or China or Egypt or Greece or Rome, but many countries have changed their political systems so often. And countries which were created since World War II have their constitutions based on a much more of a social welfare concept, that people have a right to housing, people have a right to health care. Our constitution in the United States is based on a, an 18th century concept of negative rights. The government may not do bad things to me. If you read the US Bill of Rights, the government may not take away your life or your liberty, or what in the United States is even more important, your property, without due process of law. And of course, most important, they cannot take away my gun. Nobody can take away my gun. Uh, but you will not find anywhere in the US Constitution a right to health care. So just th th this, 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 is, this is sort of a context issue here. And we have a crisis in the United States with health care costs. On a per capita basis, the United States spends about twice what many other industrialized countries spend for health care. There's a great chart on this. The United States spends about $6,714 a year per, per capita on health care. And you see, we're totally out of whack with many other co relatively comparable countries. Uh, sorry? No, this is how total, how much we spend, right? This is how much we spend on health care. And Singapore would come in, I looked it up last night, somewhere around in the $1,500 range, right? Um, we are totally out of whack in terms of what we spend per capita on health care. Oh, back a step, sorry. As a percent of GDP, we spend a lot more on health care than many other industrialized countries. It's going to eventually get to about 20% of GDP. I tell people, we're not going to have to worry about housing, education, or food because we'll spend everything on health care. And then old people like me, you young people are going to be you know, well, have, not you, people in the United States. I have to support old people like me. And unfortunately, 
we have a problem with quality of care as well. One likes to think that if we're spending this much money, you're spending a lot of money, you're certainly getting top quality. Well, unfortunately not. We have about 44,000 people a year that die from preventable medical accidents. Would anyone be horribly offended if I lose the jacket? Thanks. Thank you. We have about 44,000 people who die every year from preventable medical errors. Now, there's some people who will tell you it's really 98,000 a year. So this is the big fight in the United States. The big theoretical dispute is, is it 44,000 or 98,000? Well, it really doesn't matter. It's a lot of people. More people die from medical, preventable medical errors than from breast cancer or AIDS or car accidents. I mean, this is, this is serious. And a very interesting report from the Commonwealth Fund Commission came out in July 2008 comparing performance of different countries based on certain benchmarks. Well, the U.S. got a 65 out of 100. I don't know about your university, but in my university, 65% would not be a very good grade. And for deaths that might have been prevented with proper care, guess where the U.S. ended up last out of 19 industrialized countries? Now, we're not talking about people who were 90 years old and they were old and they died. And we're not talking about people who had terminal lung cancer and surprise, surprise, they died. We're talking about people who died from preventable medical, de 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 yeah. deaths preventable by proper medical care. The US worse than any of these other countries. Having a high number here is not good. This is not like bowling, this is like golf. You want the low number. And among industrialized countries, the US has a very high rate of infant mortality. The latest data that I've looked at, we rank, the United States ranks about 29th of all countries. And congratulations, I looked it up, Singapore is number one on the planet, the absolutely best on planet Earth in infant mortality. Congratulations, you must be doing something right. US is 29th out of all countries. We're tied with Slovakia and Poland. Now, there are variations within parts of the US. You gotta remember an average is just an average. I have a tree in the back of my house. I take my trusty bow and arrow out in the back yard and I shoot at the tree. Well, half of the time I shoot to the right of the tree, half the time I shoot to the left of the tree. Well, on average, I hit the tree. So you gotta remember what an average is. In the United States, the state of Massachusetts has a low infant mortality rate comparable to England. The state of Mississippi has a horrible infant mortality rate comparable to Russia. But on average, we're about 29th in the world. Nothing to be proud of. And so you'd think with all the money we're spending that we would be doing better. And healthcare is a real financial access crisis in the United States. It's extremely expensive to go to the doctor or go to the hospital. The prices are very, very expensive. And the US does not provide universal insurance coverage. We got about 15% of our population that's uninsured. And when I say uninsured, I don't mean they don't have enough insurance. I mean, I don't mean that they have no private insurance and they're on some government program. I'm talking about 50 million people who have nothing. No health insurance, no government program, nothing. And millions of other people are underinsured. Underinsured in the sense that their coverage is insufficient. They have to pay high out-of-pocket costs, and we're, we've developed a serious problem of bankruptcy, bankruptcy because of medical debt. And finally, the US system of health insurance imposes a real burden on businesses. Businesses pay huge health care costs for their employees, for their retirees, and for the dependents of their employees and retirees. Now, General Motors. Wow. When I left the country on Saturday, there was still a company called General Motors. I don't know, is, is there still a? You guys may be more up on this. I think, assuming there's still a company called General Motors, General Motors healthcare costs in 2005 were 5.6 billion US dollars. Multiply that times 1.36. I don't know, I'm not good at math, that's why. Well, um, the truth is, there is more healthcare than steel in a General Motors car. More healthcare than steel. And so what US companies argue is they say, we are at a competitive disadvantage against foreign companies, which have substantially lower costs. And so that's basically the quick context against which we have to start in talking about the goals of health reform and the different methods of meeting those goals. 
Any questions before we can just, yeah, sir. I was wondering if we spent on uh, medical insurance, like $5.6 billion dollars by uh, General Motors, isn't that actually going to the insuring, insurance companies themselves? or to the U.S. economy itself, because the U.S. is not very reliant on outside uh, economies to provide medical care. So essentially, isn't that money circulating within the U.S. economy itself? It, it stays, it, in, to some extent, stays within the U.S. economy, but remember that a large part of that is, going to, is, is being paid by the U.S. government. So I suppose it's going to pay debt service to Beijing. Um, but what the, you're right, in one sense you can say that money being paid is circulating through the economy, but, but it's also, there's a, there's a, a lot, it, it's not getting us what we, what we should be getting. The fact that we're spending a lot, even if we were spending it internally, doesn't really, doesn't mean we're spending it wisely. But it's a good question. Any, any other questions? Uh, sir? Um, is there any breakdown in terms of the health costs? Because uh, I believe a lot of them goes to the insurance premium paid by the doctors and the uh, hospital. Oh, you mean uh, the, uh, payment for medical malpractice liability insurance. Okay, yes, and I, I was going to mention this later. This is an important question. Boy, boy, in my class, you get a very high grade for asking such a good question. Um, it depends on who you ask, and I'll tell you what I, what I believe to be the, the truth. If you ask the healthcare industry, they say we spend a very large part of our money, a large part of our cost for healthcare, are for liability protection, for risk management protection, because we're afraid of being sued in terms of medical malpractice insurance, settlements, um, and the cost of defensive medicine. The fact that the doctor is going to do tests, not because he or she thinks you need the test, but because they're, tr they're afraid of being sued. If you, on the other hand, if you ask the the personal injury lawyers, the lawyers who represent injured plaintiffs, they point to other research that say that those actual costs are actually very limited. The truth is nobody really knows. No matter how many times, this is a very, it's, it's, a, it's a big part of the research agenda, and no one has really been able to quantify, every, depends on, on, on who you listen to, nobody has actually been able to quantify the cost of, well, you can quantify the cost of liability insurance, but the real hard thing is to quantify the cost of defensive medicine. And I'll tell you what I believe to be the case. This has become a political issue, and I think the, the American Medical Association has not been completely, they've been a little disingenuous. They've not been completely um, straightforward about the, what, what to expect. The Medical Association, the American Medical Association and liability insurance companies, they argue in favor of what they call tort reform, medical malpractice reform. I'll mention that a little, a little in a few minutes. They say that if you, they don't say, we, we want the government to change the laws because we don't want to be sued. No, no. Everybody's operating in the public interest, of course. We don't, we, they, they want you to change the laws about medical malpractice and reduce their chances of being sued in order to save money for the healthcare system. But the truth is that the types of changes that the healthcare industry is requesting would not significantly reduce the cost of defensive medicine because defensive medicine has become so enshrined, so embodied into our system that merely limiting the amount of damages will not significantly reduce the level of defensive medicine. All the, the, most, the most extreme proposals that anyone is really is seriously arguing for, which anyone is seriously arguing, is to limit, to put a cap on damages, limit the amount of damages. And so what they're, what, but the reality is that's not going to significantly reduce defensive medicine because what you're saying to the doctor is before putting a cap on damages, you can be sued for all this money, your reputation can be harmed, you can spend a lot of time sitting in court, um, the insurance company can settle out from under you and you have to pay all these premiums, and spend a lot of time in depositions, and worst, spend time with lawyers, which is horrible. On the other hand, if we now limit the damages, it just means you can be sued for less, but still have all of these problems. So, so it's a good question. There is a problem of defensive medicine, but that doesn't, the converse of that, or the obverse or inverse, is, is not, does not necessarily hold because the, the reforms that are being requested would not significantly reduce that. 
Okay. Um, goals of health reform and different methods of meeting the goals. President Obama has been leading our ongoing effort to make substantial changes. And his reform proposal is based on a fundamental value which, uh, I have to admit, the guy from the Europe, the, the diplomat, speaking diplomatically from the European Union, is absolutely right. It's a fundamental concept which you will say, well, of course, how could it be otherwise? But President Obama's proposition is that everyone, everyone should have affordable health coverage even if you happen to have a pre-existing medical condition and even if you lose your job. Seems inherently obvious, but this, these are big changes, big changes for us. And President Obama spoke to Congress uh, in September and he said three things, basically three basic goals. Number one, provide more security and stability to those who have health insurance. Provide insurance for those who don't and slow the growth of health care costs for our families, businesses, and governments. So you have multiple goals, and we'll talk in a couple of minutes about the potential conflict between those goals. There were some dis serious disagreements about several issues. Some people in Congress, particularly liberal Democrats, wanted to create a public plan, a government insurance, health insurance plan, but others were strongly opposed to that. If you, are, if you want to defeat a proposal in the United States, just call it socialized medicine. It doesn't matter if it's true, you just call it socialized medicine. People call, talk about Canada as having socialized medicine. We don't, we don't want Canadian style socialized medicine. The truth is Canada does not have socialized medicine. Canada has socialized health financing and the private delivery of medical services. They don't have socialized medicine, but that's reality. Um, if you want to defeat something, you call it socialized medicine. So some people were very opposed to this. There were disagreements about how to pay the cost of reform. We have a wonderful saying, you may have a similar saying in Singapore, don't tax me, don't tax thee, tax that fellow behind the tree. Nobody wants to pay for anything, we'll find somebody else to pay for it. And what was one of the, one of the most interesting aspects of this dispute, there were disagreements about using government funds to help people buy health insurance that would cover abortion. Now, we fight about everything, everything you do in the United States. There's always an abortion angle. Somebody is always trying to make an issue out of how will this affect abortion. Well, the proposed health legislation did not in any way affect the availability of abortion or the legality of abortion, but it became an issue because there would be some government subsidies for some small percentage of the people in the United States to buy health insurance through an insurance exchange, and what if some of that government money was used to provide coverage and some portion of that coverage could be used for abortion. That almost scuttled the whole thing. The proponents of health reform have potentially conflicting goals. There's a potential conflict between the goal of expanding health insurance coverage and the goal of reducing costs. And what President Obama wants to do, as I said, he wants to expand insurance coverage to millions of additional people. That's going to cost a lot of money. Now, he also wants to reduce the rate of increase in health care costs. And note, we're not talking about reducing health care costs. Sometimes that gets, gets conflated. People talk about, oh, reduce costs. No, nobody is talking about reducing health care costs. That's out of the question. We're talking about reducing the rate of increase in costs so that the line, instead of going up like that, will only go up like that. And we want to reduce our federal government's budget deficit. That's what we're talking about here. And so the question is, is it really possible to solve all these problems at the same time? Can you really solve the problems of cost, quality, and access at the same time? Now, in theory, it is possible to do that. In theory, we could do that. It is possible to accomplish all three goals. Other countries have done it. A lot of other countries have done it. They've done a good job. But to do that requires certain compromises. It requires certain changes to the US health system that unfortunately many Americans are not willing to make. It would require compromises in at least three ways. First of all, the providers and the suppliers, the doctors, the hospitals, the drug companies, the people who sell motorized electric wheelchairs to the Medicare program, would have to agree to make less money. So far, they have not come forward and offered to make less money. The patients would have to give up people like me, we'd have to give up some very expensive, unproven treatments, the latest drug, the latest technology, where there's no proof that it's going to work, but it might work, 
and when it's me, money's no object, we'd have to give up certain unproven treatments. And people in the United States have not been willing to do that. We would have to wait longer to receive non-emergency services. And this is very frightening to people in America, the idea that I might not get everything I want today. That's, that's a problem for us. And Congress would have to give up micromanaging the Medicare program. Now, the deci minute decisions about methodologies for the payment of doctors and hospitals and pharmaceutical companies are not made by professional experts. They're basically made by politicians who then are in a position to receive substantial campaign contributions from the vendors of fill in blank here. Congress micromanages the Medicare program in ways that they would have to give up. So far, they have not indicated a willingness to do this. Now, if we can make these kinds of compromises, then it would theoretically be possible to achieve a system where we could accomplish all three goals at the same time. But without those sacrifices, we really cannot do that. I, I wrote last, about a year ago, I wrote a short op-ed piece for our local newspaper, and I got a note from one of my former students who was a legislative health care aide to one of the top senators in the United States Congress. She said, Professor Harris, great, great, you're absolutely right, brilliant. However, give up. To you're totally useless. You're wrong. People in the United States will not accept sacrifice. That, that's, I'm embarrassed to say this, but that seems to be the way it is. And so we're sort of left in a situation where we cannot accomplish all our goals at the same time. And we may have to make some compromises in terms of what we're willing what we're willing to do. As a practical matter, the alternatives for raising the money are very limited. Some things, some proposals, will really not generate significant revenues or reduce costs. Some things are wonderful ideas for other reasons, but the reality is they're not going to raise enough money. Some things really are good ideas, but they're politically unrealistic. And so that doesn't leave us with many alternatives. All right, let's look at the things that are great ideas and will save some money but not enough. What we always hear is increase efficiency by eliminating waste, fraud, and abuse. Well, that's a wonderful idea. There's no question we have a lot of waste, fraud, and abuse. There's no question that we could save money for the health system and for the taxpayers and the insurance premium payers and the employers by reducing waste, fraud, and abuse. The unfortunate truth, though, is that we would not be able to save enough money to cover 50, provide insurance coverage for 50 million people, especially, and especially deal with the demographic changes with old people like me who are going to need more and more health care. So it's a wonderful idea. We should do it, but it's not going to get us out of the woods. It's, it's not going to solve the problem. We hear about increasing efficiency by using health information technology. It's a wonderful idea. Again, a wonderful idea, and it will probably improve the quality of care. But it's probably not going to save enough money. What about comparative effectiveness research? People say, well, let's look at what really works. We'll do those things that work. We won't do the things that don't work. That'll save all this money. Sounds great, doesn't it? Well, here the problem is that Americans are not willing to make hard decisions. We're not willing to make really hard decisions. The US Congress put about 1 billion, with a B, US dollars into comparative effectiveness research, but it came with a caveat. Thou shalt not use this information. You may, you may collect the information, but don't let me catch you using it. What Congress said is, you can figure out which treatment works. This works, that doesn't. But don't you dare use that information to decide what you will cover or what you'll pay for. No, can't do that. We're way behind. The US is way behind other countries, like European countries and, and Australia. Um, in the use of comparative effectiveness research. We're beginning to start developing uh, our, the ability to do comparative effectiveness research, but we're not willing to make the hard decisions. The closest that the United States ever came was the state of Oregon, the state of Oregon out west, where they have lots of, lots of interesting ideas, like physician-assisted suicide. Um, they had a system. They developed a for their, their Medicaid program. Now, we're only talking about for poor people here, but they tried developing a system where they ranked the value, they ranked the value that you would get from various procedures. What, where do you get the most bang for your buck? Is it in doing the heart, the heart the double transplant, or is it in providing a lot of well baby care or keeping people healthy, whatever? And we're going to 
We're going to see how much money we have. We're going to do the things where you get the most bang for the buck. What finally happened? They finally said, oh, never mind, because what happened is they realized that it, it, they would be turning down care to certain people who needed it. We have the ability in our, in our society in the United States, we, we, money is no object when it comes to saving an identified life. There's a difference between identified lives and statistical lives. We might not provide health care for children, but if one kid falls in the well, we spare no expense and bring out CNN and you know, Fox News and we all watch you know, you know, with the Klee lights. But we don't want to spend money on, on, on unidentified statistical lives. So what happened in the state of Oregon is, is they came up with this. They went through this process for years and public meetings and public participation, democratic process. But when it finally came time to actually say to you, say, lady, we're really sorry. You're not going to get that transplant. You're going you're gonna to die. Sorry, you know, such is life. They blanched. They, 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 they clutched. They couldn't do it. They looked into the abyss and they flinched and said, never mind, we can't, we can't actually turn anything down. I mentioned medical malpractice. We, people say, well, we could save all this money by reforming the malpractice system. And as I mentioned before, that's not going to save enough money because nothing they're talking about doing would really change the system of defensive medicine. In the United States, we sue people, we sue doctors and hospitals for failing to comply with the prevailing standard of care. If you were to, so, so every, whatever, whatever happens, that becomes the standard of care. So it becomes sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy. The bottom line is there are a number of, of ideas that people say, why don't you do this? Why don't we do this? And the truth is, they're wonderful ideas for other reasons. They may improve quality of care, but they're not going to get us out of the woods. What would actually work? What would actually get us out of the woods? Well, we could eliminate the current tax break for employer contributions to employee health insurance. Most health economists will tell you that this, in, this tax break is ridiculous. My compensation, such as it is for my university, I have to pay income tax on my compensation. However, the part of my compensation which comes in the form of my employer's, my university's contribution to my health insurance is tax-free income. That's tax-free, so I don't want to be paid X compensation. I want to be paid X minus something. Give me instead lots of expensive health insurance because that part of it I don't pay tax. Economists tell us that this is irrational. It, is, it costs the government a tremendous amount of money. It is unfair. It's regressive. This doesn't help people who have no health insurance. It's totally regressive. It helps people with the, who make the most money and have the richest health benefits and doesn't help at all people who earn the least. But the problem is it's politically popular. To try to change this, it would be like one of these old movies where the peasants are rising up, you know, to, you know stalking the, the castle Frankenstein with their torches and their pitchforks. Couldn't do it. We could try to require all employers to provide health insurance for their employees. What? You mean employers don't have to do that? No. No. And the general rule in the United States is that employers do not have to provide health insurance benefits for their employees. Most employers do particularly most large employers, but you don't have to. What if we pass a law? You know, people say there ought to be a law. What if we pass a law and say all employers have to provide health insurance benefits? The problem is this would be very expensive for small employers. And so what Congress would do, what they've done, is provide exemptions or provide subsidies. So it really doesn't get us where we need to be. And finally, another alternative is to reduce spending on Medicare. This is really where we're going in the United States, but it's a bit of a sham. Congress has proposed to reduce, in, the, in other words, cut Medicare spending. Medicare, remember, is the program for elderly and disabled persons. It's not, it's to be distinguished from our Medicaid program. U.S. has Medicare and Medicaid. Medicaid is for poor people, and you gotta be really poor. Medicare is for old people like me, uh, not quite, but almost, uh, and people with disabilities. So we have separate risk pools in the United States for poor people, risk people, uh, poor, poor people, elderly people and disabled people, different companies. The Medicare program, is very expensive in the United States. So Congress is proposing to cut, reduce the 
rate of increase. And, and remember that we're not talking about cutting spending. Here again, we're merely talking about the possibility of reducing the rate of increase in spending. But people object strongly. This was, there was a firestorm of protest. This was like, you're trying to kill grandma. You know, we won't, not on my watch. We're not going to let you cut the Medicare program and, and make, tell grandma she's going to die because you don't want to, you know, you don't want to spend money on health reform. The idea, this was, people saw this as a zero sum game that if we're going to cover 50 million people and make cuts in Medicare, you're basically killing grandma to cover these 50 million people. And so this was, this was a real political issue. How do you reduce Medicare spending? Do you want to reduce benefits to grandma and grandpa? No. It's much more politically palatable to reduce the payments to providers, to say doctors will get less money, hospitals will get less money, drug companies will get less money. It sounds better. But that, again, is a sham because the reductions to the providers, like doctors, are canceled, almost always canceled, either before or after the reduction goes into effect. By the formula in the law, doctors were scheduled to get a 21% decrease in their Medicare payments. Medicare is a big share because so many patient days and patient services are for people over 65. A lot of a doctor's income, a lot of a hospital's income, large share, comes from the Medicare program. And so doctors were scheduled to receive a 21% decrease. Imagine, so if you, whatever your salary is X, you know, today, you know, tomorrow you're going to be making 79% of that. Um, even the high salary some people get, you know, so that, 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 you notice that. Doctors were furious. So what happens? Congress has again now for I don't know, seventh or eighth time. A few weeks ago, Congress has extended that and said, no, all right, never mind. We can't really make a permanent decision, they say, for the next six months. And, you know, for about the seventh or eighth time. For the next six months, doctors will not lose the 21%. But what it's important to recognize is that when the U.S. Congressional Budget Office, when the, con the, the number crunchers, the nonpartisan expert number crunchers in the U.S. Congress costed out the cost of health reform, it was based on certain assumptions, including the fact that medical doctor, doctor fees under Medicare were going to be reduced by 21% two weeks ago. Of course, that's not happening. When the Congressional Budget Office measures, when they cost out the likely cost of legislation, there's always a caveat. What they say to Congress is, we, here's what it will cost if you really do what you say you're going to do. Now, we know you never have done what you say you're going to do, uh, but it's not for us to say. So if you read the fine print, when everybody argues how much is the 2010 Obama health reform legislation going to cost, it's based on certain assumptions. And what the Congressional Budget Office says is, here's what it'll cost if you really do what you say you're going to do. Now, about six months have gone by, and they've already broken the promise. They've already not done what they said they were going to do. But what Congress did succeed in doing was moving off that decision on the 21% de decrease in doctor fees, canceling that. They moved that off until after the March legislation was passed so that the cost of, that, of canceling the 21% decrease was not included in the cost of the health legislation. Very clever, but they're not fooling anybody. All right, any questions before we move on in terms of alternatives, what will work and what won't work? Questions? I need a drink, so feel free to ask questions. Sir. The answer to defensive medicine could be twofold or threefold. Firstly, uh, reform of the law. You said that the prevailing standards, however wrong, may be, rule, may be the rule of the law. That's correct. But could not that be altered, firstly? Secondly, uh, defensive medicine can also spawn a lot of litigation. Another possible solution is what is called alternative dispute resolution, yes. conciliation, mediation, on which we in Singapore are very strong. Could that not be a possible model? I would like your thoughts on these two points. Okay, uh, those are good points. Um, make a note of that, good points. Um, alternative dispute resolution is important, and it can be very helpful. We have a, a problem in the United States with that called our, it's the U.S. Constitution. Um, 
we like to, we want to encourage alternative dispute resolution as much as possible. But to the extent that alternative dispute resolution would deprive the injured patient, the widows and orphans, of their opportunity for a, a full-blown court hearing where they can go and cry before the jury, that would, in many cases, violate our U.S. Constitution or the Constitution of individual states. And so, Yes, this is a wonderful idea, and yes, we should encourage it, but in many, under many states, and, and perhaps even in our whole country, in order to pursue alternative dispute resolution, it would require both the, the hospital and doctor and the injured patient, the widows and orphans, and the plaintiff's personal injury lawyer to agree to do that. Sometimes they will be willing to do that, but it's usually the doctor and the hospital that want the alternative dispute resolution, and the, the lawyer who represents the lawyer who represents the injured patient, the widows and orphans, they don't want to agree because they want a chance to cry to the jury. They're more likely to they want the sympathy of the jury. So yes, it's a wonderful idea and we should encourage this, but there's a legal problem in trying to do that because we have a, a constitutional right to trial by jury and so generally that would have to be something to which people would agree. The second part or first part of your question is about the standard of care. Yes, we could try to change the standard of care, but this is a very contentious issue because on the other side of the doctors and the hospitals and the health, some health policy experts are the plaintiff's personal injury lawyers. And in our system, our stakeholder democratic system of stakeholder politics, the plaintiff's personal injury lawyers have a lot of political influence. They, are, they give a lot of political contributions and so the, the government is unlikely, at least the, the, current, the current administration, is unlikely to do anything that would significantly reduce the political, uh, reduce the income and the political contributions coming from plaintiff's personal injury lawyers. What the 2010 health legislation has done is encourage state governments to explore some of the kinds of alternatives things you're talking about. So the, the 2010 health legislation provides for, encourages states to try certain experiments with the caveat though that these experiments cannot, you know, cannot reduce the legal rights of the patients to sue if they want to. So good ideas, but, but it's, it's, that's been a bit of a problem for us. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Can you talk a little bit about the public option and what that would have meant, even though it's obviously too late? The public, public option is the idea of a government insurance company. The idea is that no one was seriously talking about a single payer system, as in Canada, where you don't go, you don't choose whether I want to go to Aetna insurance or Prudential insurance. In Canada, you go to the, the insurance comes from the, the Ontario Health Insurance Plan or the Saskatchewan Pro Provincial Insurance Plan. A government operated single payer system. Nobody was proposing that. What was proposed was a government option where I could say I don't like my employer's insurance. Either I don't have insurance with my employer or I don't like my employer's insurance. I want instead a, to, to go and, and get my insurance from the, from the government option. This was a real problem for a lot of people. People saw that as some people argued that was socialized medicine. And as I'll mention in a few minutes, the final resolution of all this was basically to not have a public option, but basically to preserve part of the compromise was to preserve, that, that led to the passage of the, of the legislation in March, was to preserve the existing U.S. system of private health insurance as much as they could. So the public option is something which just, it, it has not happened. Um, is it a good idea or a bad idea? Uh, you know, a lot of people like it, some people hate it, but it is, it's just, it was just not politically feasible. Um, in fact, some liberal Democrats were essentially opposed to health reform for not including it, but it was just, it was just not gonna happen. Okay, um, we'll go to what, about, about 10 more minutes and stop? Okay, cool, all right. Congress did pass the health legislation in March of 2010. Some of these new legal requirements are effective immediately. Others will only become effective in one, two, three, or even four years from now. There's some requirements that won't take effect for three or four years. And the legislation is almost 1,000 pages long. 
It's like the great French writer Alexander Dumas, who wrote these long books like, like Three Musketeers. Why? He was paid by the page. Okay? Fin nothing like financial incentives. Alexander Dumas was paid by the page. Well, this legislation is almost 1,000 pages long. It will take years to interpret it and to implement it. And many aspects are still unknown and undecided. I, I wish there was more specificity. I, I wish we had more answers. There's a lot of undecided things. On the other hand, I look at it as job security. I figure I have a job for the next you know, 10 or 20 years trying to interpret and, and explain it. Meanwhile, some state governments in our federal system of 50 state governments, some state governments have filed lawsuits to challenge the federal government's authority to adopt the law. See, we, we, what we do in America is when we don't like something, I always ask my students, what do you do when you're unhappy? And they all shout, we, they learn to say, we sue, we sue. Um, if you don't like who won the presidential election, no, you sue. You don't like, you don't like the health reform law, so you, you sue. All right. And it, I think it's important to look at what the, in global perspective, look at it in, in a global, worldwide perspective, what does the 2010 US health reform law not do? It does not change the basic system of private health insurance. There's no national health system like the UK. It does not try to set up a United Kingdom type of national health system where the government finances the system with taxes and directly delivers the services through doctors that work for the system and hospitals that are owned by the system. No, it doesn't set that up. What about Canada? Is it set up a system like Canada? No. There's no single payer system of public financing like Canada. And there's no public plan as a competitive option to private health insurance companies for all US residents. We have a public insurance plan in the United States. For all these people who say, oh, you know, that's an outrage, socialized medicine, government plan, we have one. It's called Medicare. Uh, you know, my mother's in it. You know, uh, it doesn't mean my mother's a socialist. You know, she's covered by Medicare. I will hopefully, before too long, be covered by Medicare. We have a public plan. So for all the talk about, you know, we hate a government plan, we have a public plan. It just only covers certain people. And the people who are opposed, these people we've heard about the Tea Party, these people who show up at meetings and are angry, people showed up at meetings and said, I have Medicare. I don't want the government to interfere with my Medicare plan. That's, that's socialized. I don't want the government to interfere with my Medicare. And so the person, you know, the, the congressman who's running the meeting is saying, well, sir, you know, Medicare is a government. No, hell no, no way, no way. People won't accept the fact that we have a government plan. There, the 2010 reform law did not establish one single universal insurance exchange as the universal sole marketplace where everybody would buy their insurance. Didn't do that. So these, I'm telling you the things, that for, it, it helps, I think, to look at it in global perspective. As compared to other countries, what did we not do? Now, you, 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 you don't really get the sense of how limited the US health reform law is when you hear the people screaming about this is an outrageous government takeover of the, of the health system in America. It's an outrage. You know, our forefathers fought in Valley Ford who died. It's a takeover. No, no. It's really very, very limited. But what did it do? It did make some very important changes. The law establishes certain insurance exchanges. This is basically a marketplace where some individuals may purchase health insurance regardless of their current health status. Sounds perfectly logical. The idea is you can go, if you don't have health insurance, you can go to this insurance exchange in your state and say, I want health insurance. The way it would work today is if you call up an insurance company and say, I don't have health insurance. Well, you call them and drink. You know, your call is important to us. You push one if you want group coverage for 50,000 people and their dependents. Push two if you want individual. Push two. I want individual. Hello, your call is important. Um, I want individual. If you want individual coverage and you are completely healthy and have no pre-existing conditions, push two. If you want individual coverage and you have a pre-existing condition uh, or have a medical problem, or anybody in your family is ever in sick, please hang up and go away. The concept of the exchange is that even if, God forbid, somebody in your family has diabetes or heart condition or whatever, you can still get insurance. It's a good idea. And there will be government subsidies for certain individuals on the basis of income if people can't afford it. And small businesses can buy insurance for their employees. The health reform law also provides for certain penalties for large employers. Large employers must pay certain penalties if their employees 
go to the exchange and get a subsidy. Now, that sounds kind of convoluted. It is. It's basically reaching around your head to touch your nose. Nobody has the political will to say large employers must provide insurance for their employees. So nobody said, you can't say, no employer is required to buy insurance. So what they say is they say, it goes in steps. You say, OK, you don't have to provide insurance for your employees. However, if your employees don't have insurance, if you don't provide insurance for your employees, and if any of those employees go to the exchange and get insurance, and if they're poor enough to have to need a subsidy, then we're going to make the employer pay some part of the subsidy for the person, the employee, who you didn't cover who went to the exchange. Nobody has the guts to say, you got to cover your employees. So you reach around your head and touch your nose. And most importantly, most individuals, certain exceptions, are required to buy health insurance. It's caused a firestorm of protest, but really interesting. The idea is that everybody has to have insurance. These insurance exchanges are exciting in one way. The, under the 2010 law, the use of these insurance exchanges is very limited. I can, I'm not allowed to go to an exchange. Uh, it's not just that my wife won't let me. It's that there's a firewall. The law imposes a firewall that says, I have insurance. I already have health insurance. Or I'm eligible for health insurance for my employer. I can't go to the exchange. The exchange is for people who don't have insurance. But the exchanges might provide a mechanism for additional reforms in the future. When you set it out, once these exchanges exist and you set them up, then maybe in the future we can begin to disconnect health insurance from employment. I'm not suggesting that employers should not have a responsibility. Ger the system in Germany, in, in Germany is intriguing, where the employer makes a contribution, but the employee chooses which plan to go to. I would love to see a system in the United States where the employer provides a contribution, and I make a contribution, but then I can tell the employer, please send my contribution to that health plan. It doesn't work that way today. Today, I'm stuck with whatever health plan my employer is willing, is, is willing to pay for. So I think that eventually, if you, wanna, if, you, if you follow this, maybe I'll come back next year or the year after, and we can talk about how maybe the, how exchanges may have changed over time to try to disconnect health insurance from employment. And the law will increase regulation of insurance companies. No longer will insurance companies be able to cancel a policy if a person becomes sick. No longer will insurance companies be able to refuse to cover people who have a pre-existing medical condition or charge them 10 times more so they can't afford it. So these are good things. Very briefly, political challenges. There are some people who are trying to repeal the health reform law. We'll have congressional elections in a few months. And don't, it's, it's not surprising in the United States as in some other countries. It's, it's to be expected that whichever party won the presidential election, that the next congressional election two years later usually goes in favor of the other party when people realize suddenly that the, the party for whom they voted for in the presidential election was not able to solve all the problems of the country in 20 months or 24 months, then it usually goes a little bit in the other way. Some people are trying to repeal the whole thing. It makes for great politics. Repeal the whole thing. Repeal the health reform law. You know. But the latest survey on public opinion, of which I'm aware, showed about 48% with favorable views, 41% unfavorable. Of that 41%, 27% think it ought to be thrown out right away. Um, so you see this is a pretty contentious issue. More interesting, I think, is the legal, the legal challenges. These are legal challenges by s officials of state government. State government officials, mostly Republicans, from about 20 states. That's, all, that's 20 out of 50 states are challenging the federal government, saying the federal government has no authority to adopt this law in the first place. They're going to lose. They're going to lose. But right now, it makes for great politics. They're try basically trying to gain, gain political points in contested elections, particularly in Republican primaries, where they're trying to show, I'm more opposed to President Obama than you are. How opposed? You think you're opposed to President Obama and health reform? I'm more opposed than you are. I want to repeal the whole thing. So I'm suing to repeal the whole thing. These are usually often state, the attorney general of state governments. Attorney generals of state governments, they have an organization. It's called the National Association of Attorneys General, NAAG. What it really means is National Association of Aspiring Governors. These are guys who are the attorney general of their state. They want to be governor. They want to show they're more opposed to President Obama than the next guy. Right, but they bring, they, these are the plaintiffs. 
they are bringing the lawsuits. So the lawsuits are being filed by, for instance, the, attorney, the governor of Florida or the attorney general of Florida versus federal government. It's like Florida versus United States or Mississippi versus, versus United States trying to say that the health reform law is legally invalid. And so you're right, the judiciary is separate, but they are the, these state government executives are the plaintiffs. Yes, it's primarily primarily Republican. Yeah, but it's still that's twenty states out of out of fifty. And generally, their claims are not based on strong legal arguments, but it makes for good politics. The, my 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 conclusion is that the courts will probably decide the federal law is valid. They'll probably uphold it. The question really is: Does Congress have the power to require every individual to buy health insurance? Does Congress have this power? Now, some state officials and some legal, cons conservative legal scholars say that the individual mandate is unconstitutional. They say Congress does not have the authority to make everybody buy insurance, but most legal scholars will tell you that Congress does have that authority because Congress has the power to regulate interstate commerce. In other words, commerce that affects different states. The power of interstate commerce in the United States is interpreted very broadly. The most famous case in the United States, the case of Wickard v. Filburn, involved the growing of wheat. This guy's growing wheat on his own land. He grinds, grows the wheat and he grinds it up into, into flour and he bakes it in the oven and he eats it. And he never walks, not only does he not walk over a state line, he never even, he, he never, never goes over outside of his property. He just grows the wheat in his, on his land and he eats it. Does that affect interstate commerce? U.S. Supreme Court says, of course that affects interstate commerce because by, buy, by growing the wheat on his own land, grinding it up in a flour, baking it in bread, and eating it on his own land, he did not buy Wonder Bread, which would have passed in interstate commerce. So the power of interstate commerce is pretty broad, and the most likely scenario is the court will uphold this. The court will probably decide the reform is valid. Even conservative legal scholars who say that there's a, a, a valid legal argument against it will tell you that it's, that it's most likely the courts will uphold, eventually uphold. You can, find, you can find some federal judges, a lot of federal district judges. You can judge shop. I wouldn't be the slightest bit surprised if they find some federal judge in Florida or in Mississippi or something that will say it's invalid, but it'll go up on appeal, and eventually it will be upheld. Because once Congress has done, has done it, the courts generally will defer to Congress on this type of issue. So, so the, the smart money in Las Vegas, I'm sure they're betting odds on this in Las Vegas, the smart money in Las Vegas would be that the law will be upheld. I need to finish up and just very briefly say, talk about the impact of U.S. health reforms on other countries. Why does it matter? How does this affect other countries? Well, our health reform is probably going to increase the brain drain from other countries. We're going to add about 30 million people to the roles of health insurance in the U.S. This will increase the demand for care and increase the utilization of care. Not surprising. You're going to give insurance, health insurance for the first time to 30 million people. That's going to increase the demand for care. Where are the doctors going to come from? Where are the nurses going to come from? The law takes fairly modest steps to increase the numbers of health personnel, but not nearly enough. So what are we going to do? We're going to continue doing what we already do, which is take health professionals from other countries. We want health professionals from other countries. Like a number of other wealthy countries, the U a significant share of our health workforce in the U.S. were educated elsewhere. A lot of from India, from Philippines, Pakistan, a lot of other countries. About 25% of U.S. physicians are what we call IMGs, International Medical Graduates. So if you put four doctors, four doctors in a room, or I guess more appropriately, four doctors and a, and a foursome on the, you know, playing golf. Any, any four doctors playing golf in any country club in the United States, statistical likelihood is that one of them will have been gone to medical school in another country. These are generally not U.S. citizens who did not get into medical school and are going to Barbados or Granada for medical school. Generally, they are physicians who were born and educated in other countries, and we desperately need them. A huge percentage of our nursing workforce comes from the Philippines. The, by, by covering, providing insurance coverage for 30 million people, we're surely going to increase 
the need for health personnel, and we will continue this brain drain of workers, which can cause serious problems for some of these source countries which have high burdens of disease and health workforce shortages of their own. And finally, the health reform could increase the costs for U.S. companies with all the potential effects on competitiveness. One of the goals, as I mentioned, of U.S. health reform is to reduce the rate of increase in health care costs for businesses. So General Motors and other companies will not have to pay so much as compared to foreign competitors. But a recent survey in May of 2010, what is it now, July? That's pretty recent. 90 percent, 90 percent of employers think that the reform is going to raise their health care costs. The reform, they say, you think the HR people and the executives from companies, do you think this reform is going to reduce your health care costs or raise it? 90 percent of businesses in the U.S. in the survey said this will increase our health care costs. That's going to affect the global competitiveness of U.S. companies and could encourage the increased use of outsourcing. And so, in conclusion, that's where I always get the most applause. When I say in conclusion, that's, that's when everybody's happy. Uh, the 2010 health reform law does not change the basic system of U.S. private health insurance, but it does make some very important changes. It's going to take years to implement all these provisions and answer all the questions. As far as the legal challenges go, you may see some low level, lower courts rule against the reform, but ultimately the courts will decide the reform is valid, it will hold the law, and these reforms inevitably are going to have an impact on other countries in the global community. I've appreciated the opportunity to talk to you. I'll be happy to answer questions. Good. Thank you. You have presented a very strong case. Um, now it's up to the jury to decide. Ah. Any questions? You, are you going to call on people? You want me to? Okay. Gentlemen. Uh, David White. Uh, I'm retired now, I, but I'm also the chairman of Democrats Abroad, and uh, we're interested in these issues uh, specifically. Uh, th this is a question I should know the answer to. Uh, a foreign American, uh, an American working here who, or say working in France, who's covered by a, a, a national system, is he going to get fined for not uh, buying insurance, or has that been, was that fixed the way it should have been? I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. I've got to go get my, I've got to go, uh, sorry. Um, I have, well, I still have a microphone here. I, I'm going to go have to pull out my thousand pages. It's a good question. Yeah. If you have, if there, there, if there is now an individual mandate to have insurance coverage, what do you do about the expat American employee um, s struggling in through his, his hardship post in Paris, uh, covered by there through the, the French system? Will that, is that, is that, that, that going to be considered adequate coverage? I believe it is, but I would have to go back and look at the details. There are, the uni individual mandate has many, many exceptions. So, for example, if you, you're too poor for health insurance and don't qualify for a subsidy, you don't have to get insurance. If you are a Native American Indian, you don't have to get health insurance. If you are religiously opposed to health insurance, if your religion is opposed to health insurance, you don't have to get health insurance. If you are currently in prison, you don't have to get health insurance. That's where I'm going to go. That's what I'm, I'm counting on that one. Um, <laughs> and so the answer to your question is I don't know for sure, but I think that's probably been taken care of. There are many exceptions. Sir. My name is Ajay Soni. Uh, the, the big topical issue right now is the budget deficit. Uh, the way the reform has been drafted, do you think this addresses the issue? Are we pushing the bucket down the, down the road? Are we kicking it further on? I mean, where do you come out on? We're not only kicking the bucket down the road, we're probably building a new road. We're having our grandchildren build a new road that they, to which they can kick the bucket. Basically, given the choice of, of having to deal with extending coverage to 50 million pe you know, people, or it'll probably be 30 million people, remember, none of this is going to touch the 12 million undocumented aliens, and there's going to be a lot of other people who are going to fall through the cracks. So we're talking about providing coverage for 30 million people or controlling cost. The, they will tell you the official answer. You want the official party line, the official answer, and then the truth. The official party line is that the health reform legislation contains many methods of controlling health care costs, which will eventually help us pay for things. And the truth is, all of those are pilot projects, demonstration projects, ideas, research studies, which are probably not going to really save the money. Basically, what was done was in reality was deciding we cannot 
do everything now. So we will cover everybody now and deal with the cost issues later. That's the reality. So, so I would say, yes, kick the bucket down the road. I'm Arlie Smoot. I'm a, I'm a student here at uh, Lee Kuan Yew. Um, is there anything in the new law about health education? You briefly mentioned like obesity, and I know Michelle Obama has her campaign now to try to decrease uh, obesity in children. But that seems like a, a, a long-term solution that no one seems to really address. Yeah, there are some, there are definitely some health education things. In fact, any good idea you can think of, somewhere in there, there are literally hundreds of good ideas that are stuck somewhere in there, but most of them are fairly modest. One of the things which, you, to try to deal with obesity, they're talking about, they're giving employers more flexibility for workplace wellness programs. So for instance, my employer can, if they want, my employer can start charging me more money, penalize me if I, can, if I continue to be as fat as I am and continue to drink so much beer as I do, or, or they can give me an incentive, less insurance, you know, lower my insurance premiums if I get on the wagon. The problem is these things all sound great, but they don't necessarily work. It's, you're absolutely right in saying these are kind of long-term things, um, and they don't really save that much money. There's also, gosh, if I were to say this back in my own school of public health, I'd be in big trouble because there are people who believe with religious fervor that wellness saves money. And the truth is wellness saves money in the short term. Wellness, keeping people who have diabetes out of the hospital, keeping people with, with blood high blood pressure out of the hospital saves money, but not in the long run. In the long run, we're doing, it's the right thing to do. Don't get me wrong. Don't, don't say, you know, Professor Dean Harris says, you know, just let them die. No. But the truth is, keeping people healthy and keeping people alive costs more money in the long run. So all these things sound great, but it, it's, that's not going to get us out of, out of the woods on the financial issue. But yeah, there, obesity is a big issue in health education. They're working on some of these things, but it's one of hundreds of things that are, are not well funded. Uh, yeah, yeah, Bastian, also a, a student here. Uh, so what will uh, get the U.S. out of the woods uh, when we're talking about health reform? This is a tough one. Um, sorry? Yeah. Um, what it's going to take is a sufficient financial crisis that, you know, we don't deal well unless there's a crisis. Um, well, my students don't do their homework until, you know, the project until the night before it's due. We don't, nobody deals with any, we don't deal well with anything until there's a crisis. I think if we get to the point where it's really enough of a crisis where we're going to have to do something, that might, make, might do it. What I envision, my nightmare and, and also best dream scenario is that at some point employers will just say we cannot afford this anymore. When large corporations say we no longer can afford this, we are not paying for our health insurance for our employees. We'll give our employees the same amount of money that we gave last year. You go get your insurance yourself. Then, like the fall of the Soviet Union, when Hungary lets people out, then Czechoslovakia has to let people out. I think that once employers stop providing health insurance someday, then I think we'll move more toward this exchange system. The lady there, the lady there and then uh, Professor Young here. Thank you for your lecture. I'm Sung Kyung from Asia Europe Foundation. Under the free trade agreement between the US and Korea, there are many American companies such as uh, American Insurance Group who is standing on the front line who would like to lower down the barrier to the country's health insurance market. Uh, my question is not really about the, uh, the impact of health reform of the U.S., but I would like to listen to your opinion, if you have any, on how the Asian countries can cope with this uh, rather threat than the impact of the, uh, some American insurance or healthcare companies who would like to intervene in the country and who even uh, would have a potential to huge hugely change the country's regulation on health care system. In other words, the effects of medical tourism, what does the Obama reforms mean for, for, for this part of the world where medical uh, tourism is on the rise? Huh? Are you saying medical tourism or health insurance? Yeah. Health insurance. Health insurance. Health insurance in yeah. Well, remember that under, the, under GATT, the General Agreement on, on 
GATS, General Agreement on Trade and Services, each country still has the ability to make decisions about the way in which, to specify the ways in which they will allow other countries to come in. Remember, they're the fundamental concepts that the con a country, a member of the WTO, cannot discriminate against for, you know, foreign trade, except there are still ways in which countries can limit you know, what, they will be, what they will allow to come in. And even if you allow companies to come in, you can still regulate. You cannot regulate, you cannot, so for example, Korea might decide to allow AIG and other US insurance companies to come in, but they would have to treat them on, on an equal basis, They're not preferential basis, they would still be subject to the same types of regulation that the Korean insurance companies would be subject to. So you can still, still regulate. So if the Korean government, first of all, as I say, the Korean government could still decide on how it wants to specify its, its access. But in addition, anything they do is still subject to regulation. And, and, and so you know, I'm not sure what specifically Korea has agreed to allow, but there's still a lot of room for government regulation. Mr. Young? Yeah. Youngdo Duke NS Medical School. What are uh, private insurance companies' reactions to this reform? What the private insurance companies say is that the health reform imposes obligations on them and really does little or little or nothing to reduce the actual costs of health care. To the private insurance companies, health care costs are their problem. They have to pay. They say the problem is not us. Everybody blames insurance companies. They say, if, I, if I'm an insurance company, what I say is, is, don't blame me. I'm just your buyer. I take the money you give me, and I buy services for you. Hospitals charge too much. Doctors charge too much. There's too much waste, fraud, and abuse. Don't blame the messenger. And health insurance companies are saying, all these additional requirements. I'm not allowed to cancel people now just because they're sick. I have to charge people the, you know, the same amount of money even if they're sick. Um, this is going to increase everyone's cost. At the same time, the government's saying, don't you dare raise your rates. They, you know, they're outraged. The government is shocked, shocked that insurance companies want to raise their rates. So there's a lot of posturing here. The insurance companies don't like being regulated. One of the big ass things that they're complaining about is the concept of medical loss ratio. Medical loss ratio is a term that the insurance company did not want other people to know about. In medical loss ratio is that part of the premium dollar which insurance companies grudgingly have to actually pay for health care services. They, want the lar they don't want to actually have to, if they get a dollar, 100 cents on the dollar, they want to keep as much of that as they can for administrative overhead and profit. But the new reform law is going to impose certain penalties on insurance companies if they don't spend a certain minimum percentage on their medical loss ratio. And so now one of the big fights is what do you count? You know, if you're like, must spend 85 or 90 percent of the premium dollar on actual health care, what counts as health care? So that's what they're fighting about. But the insurance companies basically are arguing that this is not our fault. Don't blame the messenger. Kansi Raja, academic from UNICEM and NTU. That imposes a need to provide health care insurance uh, to abortion, medical expenses in abortion, uh, and whether it could have implications for employers like religious groups who have very strong objections to abortion? Okay, that's, that's a good question. There is nothing in the law that requires anyone to provide insurance for abortion. The law, in fact, to the, to the, the fight is really the other way. The, the, the arguments are about whether insurance can provide coverage for abortion. No one has to provide insurance coverage for abortion under this reform law. The, it's a very contentious issue in America, although I gave a talk to 125 lawyers um, in last February, and on the issue, and one of the things I asked people, I said, I'm not asking you whether you are in favor 
of insurance coverage for abortion. What I'm asking you is, how many of you know whether or not your insurance, company, your insurance plan covers abortion? Not one person knew the answer. Nobody really knows. Everybody argues about this, but nobody really knows. But the answer to your question is, is the health reform law does not in any way require any insurance company to provide abortion. The fight is whether or not insurance companies that receive government subsidies, well, if the individual gets a subsidy to buy insurance through the exchange, or insure government subsidies through a high risk pool, whether they may cover abortion. So nobody has to provide insurance coverage for abortion if they don't want to. So that's, that will take care of the religious organization that doesn't want to. The problem comes in to pe for where people want to get insurance coverage for abortion. The way it played out was that if you go to an insurance exchange, if I have no insurance coverage from my employer, if I'm not eligible, if I go to the exchange and then I want to buy insurance coverage, if I want abortion insurance, then that money has to be segregated, separated out so that no government money, no taxpayer money can be used to provide coverage for abortion, which means the insurance company either has to sell you a separate abortion insurance rider, which is absurd. Abortion is not a, it's not an event which you would, against which you, anyone would insure. It's not something you, and no insurance company would dare advertise abortion insurance. So that's kind of a sham. But what the, what the health legislation does do that most people have not focused on is it gives the state government, the government of each individual state, the right to prohibit insurance companies from providing abortion coverage through the exchange. So you ask a good question, but the, the, the result is really the other way around. Nobody has to provide abortion insurance coverage for abortion. The question is, when are you allowed to? Can you switch it in this slide? Yes, definitely. We need yeah. this side. You don't want to come out. They asked all these questions. Yeah. I'm Ramara from India. Uh, I'm an MPA student here. I made a quick calculation. You have said the six thousand U.S. dollars per capita uh, uh, medical expense, uh, and uh, you have to now with this law you are making for thirty millions. That costs about one eighty billions. And U.S. is a rich country, and uh, you are fighting. Uh, number of wars for the... We put those government. on the credit cards, though. The wars we put on the credit cards. <laughs> but still, uh, there is a lot of um, uh, dissent among the spectrum. About 40% of the people are against this uh, legislation, which is for your own countrymen, that is the Americans. So you, you mean to say that uh, it is a social justice, uh, or, um, uh, uh, like a, towards a socialism kind of thing, that's why people are opposing this? or it is only just for political thing. So much, a uh, lot of political noises for a, a small amount compared to a lot of big issues never discussed in U.S. Congress or U.S. public uh, this one regarding how much amount you spent on uh, various various things which are perceived to be wrong by various other people. So what is the value, uh, what, what, what is the political values in the, in, your, in the U.S. compared to other democracies? Because you spend too much time on this, uh, the expenditure involved is uh, very small compared to the other major expenditures you incurred. This is my question. Um, if, if you're saying that we're, we're short-sighted and looking sort of tunnel vision and missing the forest for the trees, you're probably right. Um, we're, we fight about things and sometimes we miss the big picture. Yeah, you're right. We're spending way too much money on certain things. Um, it's become a political issue because what the, basically people, it, it's funny because it's kind of like, like you don't, you, 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 you're upset about, you don't like a system, but you don't want anybody to change the system. It's like people hated insurance companies. A few years ago, the, the worst enemies in the world were health insurance companies. They made movies about health insurance companies and HMOs, and people pick up a gun, and, you know, and, and we're not going to let the, health, the HMO you know, let my kid die. Now, everybody's saying, I love my insurance. Don't you dare take away my insurance. It's like my gun. You'll take away my health insurance when you pry it from my cold, dead fingers. So it's, it's not, it's, it's irrational. It's really irrational. It's the idea, and people in the United States don't like the idea of paying for other people. There's a perception that it's a zero-sum game, and why should I pay to support anybody else? People in Europe 
think we're, 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 we're just totally self-centered and that we lack any sense of social solidarity. We have a sense of social solidarity, but at the same time, it's, it's, it's a constant fight between our sense of individualism and our rugged individualism. And people say, you know, I, I came here, you know, and I, I brought myself up by my own bootstraps all by myself, which is, of course, nonsense because everybody helped. I, I, you know, we all got a lot of help. People say, don't take, you, how, how dare you take away something from me and give it to somebody else? But that's what a society is all about. So it's, 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 it's a little bit short-sighted. I hope I've answered your question. Next question, yes, in front of the back. Uh, uh, thank you. My name is Fei Fei. I'm from China, MPP student here. Uh, just as you mentioned, uh, U.S. is intending to hire more international medical talents like doctors from India and nurses from Philippines in the future. But uh, those countries, uh, as we all know, they have way more serious problems on healthcare issues. So maybe uh, does U.S. have any plans to release the pressure in those countries, maybe in the long, long run? The, the, I can answer that question. No. <laughs> Next question. No, the, and it's, it's unfortunate. This is, and, but remember, it's not, this is not the United States or England or Australia, you know, forcefully dragging people out of other countries. To some extent, some countries are really aggressively pushing people. They export. The Philippines, one of the main exports of the Philippines is nurses. They, they, although the Philippines has a horrible nursing shortage in the Philippines, and yet the government of the Philippines aggressively pushes the export of nurses to the point where when there was a scandal a few years ago because of cheating on the Philippine nurse exam, they had to re-give the exam because this was, this was affecting their brand. It was almost as serious as the scandal in French wine when it turned out that there was the, the domination control, the appellation controlé was, was they, 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 people had faked the label. Philippine, the government of the Philippines was, was very upset about cheating on the exam because that's their brand of their export. So it's not it's not just a one. There are push factors as well as pull factors. We have pull factors pulling people out of other countries, but there's also push factors. The, the, the short answer is there ought to be ways to try to compensate other countries. I, I'll, who is, I'll tell you who is doing a much better job of trying to work with source countries, and that's the United Kingdom. The UK, and particularly Commonwealth, the Commonwealth countries have developed some codes of ethical recruiting practices. Uh, Commonwealth country, the UK has got their own system. The Commonwealth has a has a code of ethical recruiting practice to try to work on some of these issues, but they're all pretty much just advice. Um, the short answer is no. Nobody's really doing much, and it's not just the United States. It's basically a, a, it's a lot of English speaking countries like Canada, Australia, South Africa is an interesting example because South Africa is both an importer and an exporter. South Africa exports doctors that leave South Africa and go to England or Australia, and then South Africa imports doctors from other African countries. And so the, sh the short answer to your question is no. Nobody is really doing much to help these countries with a horrible burden of disease um, and workforce shortages, and I'm concerned that it's going to get worse. Really, if I can ask the last question. Um, it's going to be a hard one. In <laughs> Healthcare reforms, you have not touched about this. Uh, we, we normally talk about the effects on access. And certainly the, um, the uh, law has actually tried to, ex to extend coverage. You know? uh, maybe not that 5% uh, illegal immigrants, uh, they won't be covered. So it will extend it, estimate it to about 95% of your population. Uh, the effects on access, on costs. Now costs, I think it's estimated that the cost will be $940 billion over the next 10 years. Someone has even raised it to eight. Uh, I think uh, David Cutler, you know, will say that uh, it has got some promising cost-reducing features, depending on how it's going to be implemented. That it could potentially spark a productivity revolution with all the uh, exchanges and so on. So it really depends on how much government is going to um, to uh, to use its uh, strength and uh, to public policy reforms, and the responses from the private sector, especially companies and insurance companies. So the question then, cost is still uh, debatable, but I think it's going to go up. You know, It's going to mm -hmm. go up, but it depends on how you, you, you manage it. And most countries have essentially rationed it 
to a public policy option or, 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 or a public uh, mm -hmm. or government intervention. Now, the, the last bit is on quality. And the quality, and, the, and, and again, we are not sure whether you will have to compromise quality for the cost. Uh, so what are, your, what are your views about this? You, don't, you do not have to compromise quality for cost. What you have to do is get a better, get a clearer, a clear definition of what you mean by quality. We make the mistake in the United States, quite frankly, we make the mistake of assuming that more is better. The bigger piece of meat is better. More visits to the doctor, more days in the hospital are better. And that's not necessarily the case. When we look, if you look at, at what makes, what provides good quality, it's not necessarily more. And so, so co good quality is not necessarily more costly. And spending, and, as, and as, as we discussed, spending more money does not necessarily improve, improve quality. And so there are ways to, there, there surely are ways to improve quality without increasing cost. One of the, I think one of the most important things to do is to improve our system of primary care. We have a, our system of primary care is not as good as it should be. In the United States, we do a wonderful job of high-tech medicine. If you're horribly sick, you've got some rare disease, uh, show up in the United States and, and go to a tertiary care academic medical center teaching hospital, and they will spare no expense keeping you alive. But if you need primary care, if you need a doctor, or like my children who always get sick on national holidays, um, and you know, we, we don't do a good job on that. For instance, Scandinavian countries do a much better job of providing good primary care. And from a public health perspective, that's really where you get the most bang for the buck, not in keeping the 95-year-old the person alive to become 90, 95 in six months. Um, and so we need to sort of re we, we, we need to go through some cultural change and maybe grow up a little bit and, and get a better understanding of what quality means. Well, on that note, let me just summarize a few things that you have said. Someone said that uh, comparing healthcare systems is, uh, is really like about comparing values, you know. And, and I think Dean Harris today has, uh, has actually stated a lot of those fundamental American values that seem to um, be very different from the values of, say, the Europeans or, or people from, from Asia. And I think you have presented a very, very strong case um, about what the reform laws can do or cannot do uh, and also those areas in which uh, there's some potential. But again, I think the jury is still out. It depends very much on, uh, on, on how it's going to be implemented and the, the responses that's going to come from, from behavior, behavior uh, from the, the, the part of the American public, the part of the uh, insurance companies, and also the, uh, the companies themselves in terms of uh, looking at the, the costs to, uh, uh, to business in, in America. I think you have, uh, you have given a very, very interesting dimension that is from the uh, perspective of your, uh, from the legal background that you have, you know. So I was actually expecting a clinical uh, dissection of uh, the issues, but uh, I think your, your legal uh, background has given us uh, a lot more to think about. Um, and certainly healthcare reform is not easy, and uh, basically you, I think you have enlightened us. We have heard so many uh, perspectives, and they're very conflicting, uh, you know, uh, perspectives, views from different parties, depending on which side of the, uh, of the continuum you are uh, on. Uh, but also, I think uh, you have given us um, an informed um, view, uh, trying to cover as many of the aspects as possible. So we thank you for that. And finally, I think you have kept us all very uh, entertained and uh, with your animated uh, and, and very enthusiastic uh, responses. So thank you. On behalf of the school, thank you very much. Thanks. Pleasure. Thank you.